Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the... Packers lose for everything you need to know. It's Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be talking about the Bears' latest edition, uh, Little Bulls little baseball because opening day is coming up and maybe we'll sprinkle in some terrible Blackhawks. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow, family-friendly, affordable prices. Season is going on right now, so head on over to icehogs.com. Get yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how is it going? I'm doing just fine. Doing just fine. You know, you and I were talking before this show about the cold weather and the snow and how we want it to stop. But I will say, today wasn't bad out. High 40s by me. The sun was out. And I'm like, I'm going to relish in this because that's probably the nicest it's going to be all week because we got opening day at Wrigley coming up and a lot of rain in the forecast and uh, some cooler weather. So... Yeah, uh, have fun with that Cubs playing out there. This weather is terrible. I was telling you, and I'll tell everybody else, is I had to go to Milwaukee yesterday, and there was snow accumulation on the ground. Um, so, like, on the sidewalks, it was pretty melted. Um, but on people's lawns, it was just covered in white. Pure white. And I was like... And I, it was r- snowing fairly heavy and like these giant snowflakes, like the biggest snowflakes I've ever seen. Yeah, they were big down here too. Yeah. And the whole way up 94, just, you know, snowing like crazy. And I, I knew it was snowing, obviously so I'm driving in it, but to didn't think it would be accumulating. Yeah. You know, I was on the road yesterday. I was just going to 290 from Elmhurst to Schaumburg. The usual way to the halfway point of my commute to work, but I was going to Woodfield Mall for the day and it was raining when I left. Okay, just rain. As soon as I hit 290, all of a sudden those raindrops got more solid and more solid. And within seconds, it was like hard snow. And when I mean hard snow, I mean hard snow. So those snowflakes were as thick as regular snow, but weighed like full water like you know, more than just drops, you know, like when you get that heavy rain, it feels literally heavy. It was that in snow form. And I mean, you could not see maybe 10, 15 feet in front of you. Everything was just a white blur as I'm trying to make out the headlights on 290. I'm like, wow, I I didn't think um, I'd be risking my life like this, just going to Woodfield Mall so that was, that was just, ugh, that was just gross. And it was, it's not like it was a quick passing storm. It was doing that for a few hours. Was the fog so thick that Yukon Cornelius popped up to tell you how thick the, the fog was? I was waiting for him. Honestly, <laughs> I, I was waiting to see him out there. <laughs> uh... Start singing silver and gold. I mean, it, I, I would have been saying, man, it's Christmas in April. <laughs> uh Yukon Cornelius. <laughs> what an what a legendary character. Seriously, the beard, the mustache that's pointy. One day I want to be him. Just <laughs> just be Yukon Cornelius. You know, it, it, talk about this weather. Think about the Cubs and Sox in spring training right now. They're in warm Arizona. And th- the Sox are going to go to Detroit, so also up north, and the Cubs are going to open here at Wrigley Field. It just makes me laugh how they have to go from sunny, bright, warm, dry Arizona to Chicago or the Midwest, the Northern Midwest. 
I mean, it, uh, to play outside in I, that. I, it's so annoying. Like, why, why do Chicago teams open up either in Chicago or in other cold weather cities that are outdoor? Yeah, you know, I always thought about that. Like, wouldn't it be helpful if, like, Teams like the Cubs, the White Sox, you know, maybe Detroit Tigers, some of those teams just open either in the southern cities or anywhere with a dome. So or West Coast. Would, or West Coast. You know, like if the Cubs played Milwaukee, but they were in Milwaukee, that place is a dome. You know, not as big of a deal. And they're playing that team. They're playing a team with a dome. Flip flop, yep. flip flop series. Yeah. And it's Milwaukee. It's a, it's an hour difference. It's not like you're flip flopping with the Dodgers or the Giants or even like the Mets or the Phillies. I mean, it's it's an hour and a half up the highway. You know, you could easily flip flop a series with Milwaukee. Yeah. Like there's I don't understand why they don't, because then there's no weather issues, because if you have to postpone games, Like, you know, they're, they're getting a full season in, but they're starting later. Right. So, so delays and, uh, you know, make doing makeup. So it's going to be, it's going to wind up being a lot of double headers down the, down the stretch. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it with both teams in Chicago with the Cubs and the Sox. That happens a lot early on a lot of snow outs, rain outs, whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's just silly to me that. You don't try to eliminate that as much as possible. Yeah, I know. I don't know if you remember this, but it was 2018 and the Cubs had the home opener and it it got snowed out because there was multiple inches on the ground. Like it wasn't just like snowflakes falling. Like it was accumulating. It was building up. It, It looked like an old time bears game at Wrigley field. If, but if I'm not mistaken, that game was actually in the very end of March, right? Uh, It was like the first week of April because they opened that season in Miami. So think about that too. They opened in Miami, Miami, Florida, (laughs) come back to Chicago. Oh, there's a blizzard. And I like the, the Midwest accent you threw in that. Oh, 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 (laughs) we'll see. We, we Midwesterners, we know we do it, but we can't control it. Oh, I know. It's it's funny because I I don't realize that I even do it and I don't realize even that other people are doing it most of the time until I'm around people that aren't from the Midwest. And then I realize it really quickly. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh I did it again. <laughs> the Britney Spears Midwest song. Oh, I did it again. That would be amazing. Where, where's Weird Al with that one? <laughs> yeah get him on the phone we got an idea the king of parodies uh, get on this <laughs> uh but it's f- nice to finally have baseball be back for real not spring training um and finally having real games that matter after this stupid lockout um new collective bargaining in place and yet Michael Conforto still doesn't have a job. Well, I don't know if you heard, but there was uh he had some shoulder issues. So it's probably what's holding it up. Oh, I'm sure that has something to do with it. I'm sure the combination of that vaccination status and contractual demands, because I believe he's a Boris agent. If I'm not, or Boris is his agent. If I'm not, mistaken well i know he wants a payday you know he's he's looking for the money and when you're hurt that puts a damper on things yep and shoulder issue so uh as a hitter you know that's that's no bueno right right but you know we are still seeing a lot of deals happening i mean just today the padres made a deal for sean Manaya, and sean Manaya was a pretty pretty sought after asset and with sean Manaya going have you seen that, like the A's payroll at this point? Oh God, I'm sure it's like thirty-eight million dollars. I think it's less. I think it's 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 around thirty something. I mean, it's tiny. The fact that that's even legal. I mean, you go through 
all this stuff, you know, with the collective bargaining agreement and salaries. And here we are at 33 million. That is their payroll. 33 million over an entire team. In 1991, according to John Hayden, uh, John Heyman, 33 million was the payroll for the Oakland A's. In 1991, that was the highest in baseball. Isn't that something? <laughs> That's crazy. I'm Over pretty sure Garrett, Garrett Cole is making more in a year to pitch. Uh, yes. Yes, he is. To start 30 to 33 games, one guy who pitches every five days is making more than the entire Oakland A's major league roster. I don't understand why they're allowed to do that. Well, you know, I mean, salary cap is not easy to implement in baseball at this point. Salary floor shouldn't be that complicated. You know, right. Agreed. There absolutely needs to be a floor. And if you're a team that can't afford to, to have that floor, then you should sell it to somebody else or move the franchise. Or take on Jason Hayward's contract. <laughs> well, did you see the almost trade between the Padres and the Mets? Yeah, well, you know, we were monitoring that pretty close because the Cubs had been linked to a similar deal with the Padres. For You know, we talked about it on the show, taking on... Mm-hmm. Hosmer's contract in order to get a few more uh, top tier prospects. But yeah, I mean, the way they were going into detail, it almost sounded like from what they were making it sound like it was sounding like it was imminent. And then it just all fell apart, just like the Mets hopes and dreams every year. Well, I mean, that that trade, I don't know if you saw the details. Um, I, it didn't really make a lot of set, sense. No, it, it didn't. It wasn't as straight up as we thought, like with the Cubs. It's like, well, if the Cubs <clears> give them you know, Contreras and maybe something else, then we take on Hosmer. We'll take on also top tier prospects. That makes more sense. What the Mets and Padres were looking at, I was just kind of scratching my head like, wait, what? Yeah. So the Padres would have paid half of Eric Hosmer's contract roughly and sent Chris Paddock, who is a meh pitcher. Right. Very odd. And um, to the Mets, the Mets would have taken the other half of Hosmer's salary and sent Dominic Smith back to San Diego. So it's essentially they would have bought Chris Paddock, um, which I ju- it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, well, I know the it, Mets are kind of in panic mode. Well, with DeGrom, Jacob DeGrom yeah. again. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, I mean, that, that's a big panic mode to me, honestly. It is. It is. Um, I mean, the, the Met or the Padres were trying to work that one. <laughs> yeah, they were. And I mean, how how do you feel if you're Eric Hosmer? You're sitting there, currently still on a roster of a team that clearly is trying to deal you away. Eric Hosmer, how do you sleep at night knowing this? On top of a big pile of money with many beautiful ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I mean, he's making a ton of money that that contract he got was huge. He has like what? $60 million left on it. Yeah. It's like four more years. Like that, that dude is making a lot of money. So, and, and he's a guy that probably would get a very small deal if he was on the market right now. Right. Right. Like in his prime, he was a very solid player you know he was a solid player and he was a part of uh two pennant winners in a world series in kansas city but you know he was never the level of you know a top tier first baseman like a jose abreu or a freddie freeman you know wasn't anywhere near that it was always a weird fit to me eric Hosmer in san diego especially in a park that's not very hitter friendly But I want to talk a little bit about one of the one of the teams here in Chicago uh, that plays on the south side. Um, and uh, they made a trade, um, and they were able to 
um, do a really good job of trading uh, Craig Kimbrell to the Dodgers for AJ Pollock. And I think that was a big win for the White Sox. I think that was a steal. I think that was, I think Rick Hahn stole AJ Pollock from the Dodgers. Now I understand LA's crowded, the outfield's crowded, and LA can afford to lose an AJ Pollock. But I think in terms of, I mean, on paper, based on their resumes, it makes perfect sense for both teams. The White Sox get a good hitting outfielder who can hold his own in the field as well. The White Sox are the Dodgers are getting their closer because they lost Kenley Jensen. On the surface, that all makes sense. But is Craig Kimbrell going to be any good? I'm not so sure. He wasn't AJ, in his first outing. No, he wasn't. No, he, was, he wasn't. He was downright bad. Yeah. Yeah. He was bad with the he was bad in his appearances with the White Sox this spring. The Cubs really did get him back on track at the right time <laughs> to flip yeah. him. Yeah, the pitch lab or whatever. But I mean it was you know, Rick Hahn did a great job. He got an outfielder and which was what they needed. Um and now you have options of what to do with a uh, designated hitter and your outfield. Um, now it's going to be a little bit of getting, making sure everybody gets at bats. Um, so I'm imagining, I, I mean, uh, you're set at center fielder. That's an everyday center fielder. Right, right. Luis Roberts, who I think could win the MVP this year, you know, he's going to be in there as long as he's healthy, he's going to be in there. No question. Um, it, this gives you the opportunity to potentially give more designated hitter at bats, uh, for your left fielder who is a terrible fielder. Mm -hmm. Um, it gives you opportunity to, um, to, uh, put, Abreu, give him some days off or move him to DH at points. Um, so you have guys that can shift around a little bit. So you're, you're set. If there's some injuries, you have the flexibility to give people days off or to switch around who's going to be DH. Um, I, I, I like that. And I think AJ Pollock is, gives you some of those options. The, the He's very man. underrated hitter too. I mean, AJ Pollock could hit for power. He could hit for average. Uh, you know, he has plenty of postseason experience. He's won before. It's a great fit for the White Sox. It's a great move for the White Sox, and that's the big win of the weekend. Yeah, and but you know, you've got options now. Eloy Jimenez can go to DH, or he can play a little bit in left field. But mm-hmm. you could take him out and move him to DH in uh, situations of. Uh, you know, defensive substitutions. Um, it uh, Vaughn, you can put him in the corner outfield spots, or you can move him to first base or DH. Uh, Bray, you can be then DH or first base. Uh, it's 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 got some. You've got some working parts that allow you the flexibility. And I, I still, you know, you sort of addressed your second base issue, with Harrison and platooning with Larry Garcia. And is that a perfect fit? Probably not, but I feel like it's, it's good enough. You've got your outfield fixed. Um, you know, even getting rid of, of Kimbrel, your bullpen is still awesome on paper. Uh, um, yeah. And you know, the, the, two other issues you had were backup catcher and adding another starting uh, pitcher. And I think that they were going to go in with what they had at starting pitcher. And right off the bat, you lose Lance Lynn for a month. At least a month. I mean, it's going to be four weeks before he resumes like full activities again. So you're pro- Really sucks, but you're probably not going to see him until mid-May at the earliest, which it could be worse. It could be worse, but not what you like to see at all. Nope. Um, 
yeah, he has a small tear in his right tendon, right knee tendon. Um, sidelined for approximately four weeks before he can throw off a mound again. So he may not, in, per um, MLB trade rumors, they said you might not see him until late May, given the recovery period and then a ramp up period. Right, right. Uh, I mean, that's your best pitcher right there. That's, I mean, Giolito might have been the starting opening day pitcher regardless, but Lance Lynn's your best arm. Let's, let's be real here. And so <clears throat> that leaves you as options of Reynaldo Lopez, Vince Velas- uh, Velasquez, Jimmy Lambert, and Wes Benjamin. Well, I think you can, I think you can live with that at the beginning of the season, but if you're going to the playoffs, E, you know, it, if it's going to have, if, it's, if you're going to have a devastating injury in your rotation, have it now and early so you can get him back, you know, before midsummer. That would obviously be ideal. Cause I think at the beginning of the year, you can live with that. The, the AL Central is improved overall, but I still think the White Sox are light years better than any other team in that division right now. So you'll be able to get by for a while, but eventually you're going to have to shore up that starting pitching. Yeah, you need to. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the Achilles right now. And you, um, you know, the other right off the bat, you also lose Garrett Crochet for the entire season. That's just a real bummer for him. There was a lot of people saying that they were afraid this was going to happen because of last year you could see some declining velocity and things just weren't looking right. And, you know, you don't want, you don't want to just give someone a surgery, but people were saying, man, it would have been nice if he could have gotten that surgery right off the bat. But you know, that, that, that wasn't the case. And now he's going to need it. It sucks for him. And I feel terrible. They have to go through that, but if you get it while you're young, it's not a death sentence like it once was. That's the good thing. Absolutely. You know, players come back. You know, it's, it's funny. You listen to some young pitchers and they, it's like a rite of passage. Oh, I got Tommy John. And then you're excited because you're like, oh, man, I'm look, eventually I'll come back and I'll be stronger. Right. It's happened with a lot of pitchers, you know, with medical technology that we have this day and age. And the better understanding we have of rehab and conditioning, a lot of these pitchers come back much stronger than where they were before. So, you know, that's what you hope for. For both sides of town, you know, two key relievers. You had Cody Hoyer go down for the Cubs. You had Garrett Crochet go down for the White Sox. So, you know, you hope that's the case for both those guys. And luckily for the White Sox, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, they got a deep bullpen. And if they're healthy and playing like they should be, then they'll still be a really good bullpen. You know, you got Joe Kelly. That's nice insurance. You have Kendall Graveman. If he can repeat what he did last year, or at least, you know, pitch anywhere close where he did last year. And then you got Hendricks closing games. You know, you feel, you feel pretty good about that. You know, you also have Aaron Bummer, who's despite the name is very, very good. So if those guys can stay healthy and pitch to where they're usually at, then they'll still be a very, very good bullpen. And slight tangent, what you were saying that medical technology has gotten better. You know, when I was younger and, and first watching sports, if you tore your ACL, like that was a career ender. You just, sure. I mean, that was pretty much the, you're done. And then you look at, I mean, best case scenario is Adrian Peterson tore his ACL in 2011. He came back, what, like six months later? Mm hmm. And he rushed for almost 2,100 yards the next season. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I could make a cruel joke. I'm going to make a cruel joke. I'm sorry at your expense. When you were talking about medical technology, I really wanted to say back in your day, they used to bleed them. <laughs> they just took them out back and shot them. <laughs> what, like a horse? Yeah. <laughs> well, glue factory. Sorry about that, buttercup. Sorry, buttercup. You know what happens. I don't want to do this. Oh man. But yeah, I, you know, John Lackey comes back with buttercup too. 
<laughs> Buttercup one had a little hitch in her get along. So, you know, had to do the old thing, had to call the horse doctor. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing when you look at even just the medical technology that teams have access to. You look at the facilities now. You look at the training facilities, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, and it's just state-of-the-art. Even 15 years ago, it wasn't as sophisticated. It's amazing how much that the medical field has evolved, just how much smarter the doctors are getting, how many discoveries we're making in terms of you know, making the right medical decisions and how we go by, by these things, how, what we're able to do by rehab even like you know rehab it's more than just you know lifting weights it's more than going on an exercise bike there's so much that goes to it and you know the smarter they get the better understanding they have of just how to do it you know you see so many more success stories after a a big big injury um white Sox also made another trade today they traded uh zach collins to the Blue Jays for Reese McGuire, which I I think sort of alleviates one of the concerns I just mentioned about backup catcher. Um, Zach Collins, decent bat, but not that great behind the plate. Uh, Reese McGuire is a more established major league uh, catcher and a better defensive catcher. So I think this actually allows you to either move Grandal to some at bats at DH and or and or take some days off. Yeah, no, I mean defensively, that's a really good move for the White Sox. I think they needed to get a catcher like that. Just uh just keep them away from Dollar Tree parking lots. <sighs> yeah, didn't you know I, I, you know, we all do things, and as long as that doesn't happen again, it won't be a problem. I'm just saying, you know, it just, uh, you know, I, I know you got to get a grip on wood when you're a a baseball player, <laughs> but, you know, there's certain places and certain times you do and don't want to do that. I mean, you know. Just uh, thinking about those great deals you're going to get in Dollar Tree gets some people really excited. Yeah, I mean, especially this day and age, groceries are expensive, gas is expensive, and you know, Dollar Tree, you could get that vacuum sealed steak. You could also <laughs> get cap guns and knickknacks. It's never good when TMZ is reporting on sports. No. No, 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 it's just, no. it's just this bad recipe. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. No, you, you ain't kidding about that. I'm okay. just saying though, this, ha- the incident happened in Florida. Right. So is that really a big deal in Florida? Just Compared kind of like- to what they see? That's like the equivalent of seeing like some guy here, like accidentally, toss their empty McDonald's trash and it missing the trash and landing on the ground. Uh, I mean, there are literally Florida man generators on the internet for a reason. <laughs> uh, did, did you, did you see what the actual charge was? Wasn't it like indecent exposure? Uh, misdemeanor exposure of sexual organs. <laughs> Mm. Mm. (sighs) was this at night or was this in the middle of the day i don't know Um, i would hope it's at night who would do that in the middle of the day (laughs) Um. (laughs) you have something to tell us I'm just reading the TMZ article about this. It said, it said, uh, his sweatpants were around his ankles. And that's all I could think of is like a six year old going to the bathroom, a public bathroom with his pants all the way around his ankles. Ew. 
<laughs> holding his shirt up by his nipples. And <laughs> <laughs> that's what it says. No, but I'm just, that's all I can picture. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh. It's like when Butters goes to the bathroom in South Park. Yeah. Uh. Cops say during questioning, McGuire told them, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This is really embarrassing. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm going to confidently say White Sox fans, I think he learned his lesson. Yeah. Make sure you do it at Target. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't do it at Dollar Tree. <laughs> and please don't do it in the parking lot where people tailgate. It does not say the time of day. I, I, I just hope it was at night because who the hell would do that in the middle of the day? Uh, I mean, who is doing that period? Well, yeah, but I mean, if you're going to do it, don't do it during the middle of the day. I mean, it happened in July. Shouldn't it, shouldn't it have been during the season? Like, wouldn't you have been, I don't know, prepping well, for didn't- a game? Well, didn't they say it was outside of like the spring camp? So maybe, maybe he was like minor league rehab or something. Maybe. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know because the, when they mentioned that facility, when I, I, I only glazed that part of the report, like the headline or like the sub headline, it mentioned that. So I thought, oh, it was like spring training or something, but no, it was, I guess it was in July then. Uh, but yeah, they're the, the good defensive backup catcher, and <laughs> there's that good pitch framer. <laughs> Just don't go for a car ride with him. <laughs> no. Well, you know what I did is I I uh, I quote tweeted it, and I took the uh, the gif of the line from. Uh, Dodgeball, whatever you do, wash your hands. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) This is even better than when Moises Alou peed on his hands. Yeah, I mean, that's sterile. Also, another dodgeball reference. (laughs) Necessary? Is it necessary that I trick my own urine? Nah, but it's sterile and I like the taste. I use that line all the time. It's <laughs> sterile and I like the taste. Rest in peace, Rip Torn. He was iconic in that role. Oh, Rip Torn. What, what was I just watching the other day with Rip Torn in it? I was watching several things with Rip Torn in it. But it was like, it was an older movie and it, uh, it was a young, younger Rip Torn. Oh, man. Driving me crazy now. Well, I know Rip Torn was in the one uh, movie about Christ, the King of Kings. He was one of the apostles. That was made like in the early 60s. No, definitely wasn't that. Um, he was like a general. I, I I've saw, oh, I, I, I know. Saw. It was, uh, it was um, uh, what's the one with John Candy where he uh, he's like the border patrol. Canadian bacon. Oh, Canadian bacon. I forgot he was in that. Cause I was going to say, I also watched him as a general, but that was in a serious movie. It was um, actually kind of, you know, creepy how relevant it is with the times. It's uh, it was an HBO movie called Dawn's early light. And it's about Russia starting a nuclear war and like, you know, the world's getting nuked and Washington DC gets nuked and James Earl Jones is in it. Uh, Rip Torn is the general. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior is played by Darren McGavin, aka the dad from Christmas Story. Uh, he's this corrupt. Uh, the Rip Torn is like this crazy colonel who wants to have this big counter strike against the Russians. So, yeah, I, I recently watched that with Rip Torn. Have you ever seen Canadian Bacon? I've only seen parts of Canadian Bay. Oh, it's super good, but uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, it's funny. I I didn't realize it until I rewatched it that it was directed by Michael Moore. I had no idea. Like the the Fahrenheit nine eleven and Bowling uh, Columbine 
not my Michael Moore. Yeah. So that was yeah. a little, little weird. And I, you know, it's, it's funny to see John Candy in a movie that came out that late because you, the references in there, you're like, man, I'm like, when did, when did this come out? And it was 1995. And I, you know, I don't know. Part of me just always like, uh, thought that John Candy was dead before that. Well, didn't he die in 94? He did, but the movie, I mean, he probably died like right after this movie was done filming. Yeah, because he was making another movie when he died. It was like a Western, I think. There's something to do with the West. But yeah. that must was, have been made just before. Yeah, wasn't it with uh, the guy from Friends? Maybe. I don't remember the details, but, you know, if you tell me it has John Candy in it, like, I'll watch it. Yeah, Canadian bacon is 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 super good. I like. I was that just one. I was just watching Planes, Trains, and Automobiles again, and I love that movie. Oh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles! Because both <clears throat> Steve Martin and John Candy are two of the best comedic actors who ever lived, and they each brought their own unique shtick, but. It blended so well. The chemistry was perfect. It just did. You couldn't have asked for a better duo for that movie. You know, I, it's weird. Chris Farley did not die that long after John Candy. No, he didn't. Like th- three years later. Man. That would have been an awesome movie if you had a father, like they were father son character, John Candy and Chris Farley. Oh, I could see that happening. That would have been amazing. The world was robbed of that movie happening. Yeah. True. And, but in this world, this, you know, in this world where that movie happened, we also get a remake of Dumb and Dumber where Seabass is played by John Lackey. Oh my goodness. <laughs> kick his ass, Seabass. Me and Buttercup are going to kick his ass. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you and I are the only people on this planet that would come up with that idea. <laughs> yeah, we were robbed with John Lackey being with John Candy and Chris Farley. <laughs> Who the hell says that? Us. <laughs> Christina Lackey too. <laughs> She's like, that's been always been my wish. My husband with Chris Farley and John Candy. Those two and those two only. Uh, uh, so yeah, back to the White Sox. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, they're, they're going to be a very good team. It's just <laughs> sucks that right off the bat that they're getting dealt some, some shitty blows. You know, is is Garrett Crochet going to be the end of their season? No, but man, he should be a nice piece to have. A guy that throws Absolutely. that hard. Um, is losing Lance Lynn for a couple of weeks the end of the world? No, but you know, it always sucks to have a pitcher that you really are relying on going down. Um, and you're probably going to have Reynaldo Lopez in your starting rotation. F- for the for the next you know month and a half or two months right it just you know it sucks that lance lynn has this injury and what makes me a tad more concerned about that is considering his age and you know the knee is kind of important you know i'm not saying he can't come back and do well it's just you know, if you looked at which injury was a lot more devastating, it's obviously going to be Lance Lynn, even though even though Crochet is going to miss the whole season. He's very young. He'll come back strong and you have a deep bullpen. Like I said, Lance Lynn is your number one pitcher. He's 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 crucial. So you just hope that when he comes back, he's, you know, back to form or close to back to form. That's the hope. I mean, you're, you're really relying on it. Um, I think, I think if Dallas Keuchel can regain some version of Dallas Keuchel from a couple of years ago, 
you can ride this out. Mm. But if if Dallas Keiko starts mm. regressing and he, you're, you're going to start the season off a little slow, unless mm. unless unless your bats just really start putting up 12 runs a game. And you just I was going to say people. that offense can carry the load for the beginning of the season. Like we just let a fan pitch and see if we can out hit the other team. Well, if everyone's healthy in that lineup, you probably could. <laughs> that lineup is going to be a murderer's row. Yeah, that might be one of the be- top five, I'd say. Um, so I'm I'm excited to watch some some White Sox baseball this year. They're they're going to be a really good team. Um, but the Cubs, on the other hand, um. Do we have the list of their final cut down? So they just announced a few cuts. I saw Jesse Chavez is going to make the active roster for the. Yeah, which is no surprising. Uh, one guy who was sent down who I thought was going to be on the roster was Manny Rodriguez, the reliever. But, you know, maybe they want to work on some things. He's got options. So whatever. So six non roster invitees have been assigned. I was roster. Adrian Samskin, Mark Leiter Jr., Eric Yardley, Kane Euchre, John Hicks, and P.J. Higgins. Uh, Manny Rodriguez, option Iowa. Chicago spring rosters of 36 players consists of 20 pitchers, which includes non-roster invitees, two catchers, eight infielders, and six outfielders. So it's interesting. Have you noticed who hasn't been sent down to AAA yet? Um, I didn't catch who, who did I not, who did I not mention? Who's uh, kind of a big name. I don't know who Brennan Davis. Oh, you're right. Well, not yet. I, I mean, it's still coming. I, oh, I know. I, I'm just saying, I mean, did they, did they actually deal with that on the, in the collective bargaining about service time? Eh, it sounds like it's still kind of a thing, but I will say, I will say. I was thinking I'll, pitchers when you were talking. I was like, what pitcher are they talking about? Oh, and, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah my bad. Bre- yeah, Brendan Davis, that's, I, I'm st- I still would be shocked if he's, he's on the opening day roster, but. Me too. Um, That would be, that would be cool. And you, you know, unlike Chris Bryant, Chris Bryant was more than ready to come to the majors. Absolutely more than ready when they held him down. Could Brennan Davis make the majors? Yeah. Do I think it's necessarily a bad thing to have a few more weeks of seasoning in the minors? Not really. I mean, he's going to be up eventually this year. Is a few, you know, he gets another month or so in the minors. Am I going to complain too much? No, he doesn't have as much time in AAA. He went to AAA late last year, but. Oh, you see some of the swings he has, though. And did did you see that home run he hit to dead center last week? Yeah, I did. I mean, it looked like an effortless swing, and that ball just flew out of there. It's so smooth. I mean, just easy power that kid has. Yeah, I mean, spring was a mixed bag for him. Um. You know, he, uh, he looked decent, um, but you're right. I, I think he had a couple of home runs in the spring. He did. Um, he also least, got hit in the knee. Yes. Um, so I, you're right. I, I, I'm not going to be upset if he gets sent down. I'm not going to be, um, bothered by it. If he makes the opening day roster cool that'll be fun to watch give me even more reason to watch um so it'll it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens you know i i'm a little nervous about the season so far because some guys that we're going to need to hit you know didn't didn't really hit the ball that great in spring um you know, Milt Wilson Contreras, not so good. Uh, I can't help but wonder if Willie's deal is all the distractions of the trade rumors. 
Yeah. Nico Horner didn't hit that well. Um, Patrick Wisdom didn't hit that well. Jason Hayward hit abysmal, but we weren't really expecting him to. No, no. Um, Ian Happ did not <laughs> did not hit well. Frank the Tank did. Frank the Tank hit like crazy. Uh, he hit like oh, around 400, didn't he? Yes, he did. And even if it was a few rough few first at bats, we're starting to see the power flex from Saya Suzuki. Yeah, I mean those those first at bats were a little rough, but I mean he's I think I think come June he's going to be clobbering things. Yeah, I mean he was he had to make some adjustments and you already saw adjustments made. The first few at bats you saw a bigger leg kick and then when he did the toe tap, not the leg kick, he started hitting him out of the park cuz now he's got three home runs and the one he hit the other day like I, like I said with Brennan Davis, I mean, the swing just looked effortless, and that ball just flew out. I mean, his his power swing is absolutely insane. If he connects, it is going a very long way. Yeah, he's he's got power to to no end. Um, so it'll, I mean, it, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be a nice balance to some of the lighter hitting guys like. Nico Horner and Nick Madrigal. Nick Madrigal's gotten some pretty solid swings and though. Like, yeah, he's hit some ground balls, but he's hit some doubles in the gap and he had a few line drives that were caught. So overall, I can't, you know, considering where Nick Madrigal was missing all that time last year after getting injured, I, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with what I've seen with him in spring so far. Um, yeah. So, uh, your your boy Kyle Hendricks. No, uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, uh, if this was any other year, I wouldn't blink. But after last year, and seeing the trend continue, we'll worry. Yeah, between Mills and Hendricks, just get pounded this spring. Yeah, not yeah. And I, I get it. You're playing in Arizona. It's not ideal for pitchers like that. But we saw last year, man, I just let Kyle Hendricks just took such a big step backwards last year. And I hope opening day it's nice wind blowing in. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I'm not declaring it over yet with him, but couldn't lie if I was a wee bit concerned. Hurricane force winds blowing in. Everything's just yeah. pop up on the infield. Exactly. Uh, you, you see, if this was an Adam Sandler movie, you'd see like a silhouette of Harry Carey with a giant like a uh, fan blowing everything in. Yep. And, and then wave waving to uh, Kyle Hendricks in the dugout. <laughs> uh, like it was happy gilmore yeah <laughs> uh yeah so uh, th- this rotation man this rotation is going to be brutal this is yeah. not going to this is not going to be an awesome season if if it wasn't for the reds just waving the white flag and pittsburgh being perennial white flag wavers um you know this would be even more brutal uh, like the you brewers, just hope like the brewers the brewers are going to be okay they're just going to have a tough time scoring runs that pitching is going to carry them like last yeah, year they, that pitching is so good but they just can't really score runs so i don't i don't look at them to be an elite team there's but with the cubs hitting they're just not going to be able to uh you know, do anything against them. So, I mean, I honestly, the stupid Cardinals are going to win this division, aren't they? With their retirement home. And then, you know, and the car, the Cardinals on paper, aren't that spectacular. Yeah. You got Paul Goldschmidt. He's really good. Nolan Arenado's good. Uh, Dylan Carlson, uh, you know, really, really good. 
But if Jack Flaherty isn't healthy, then your best starting pitcher is what? Adam Wainwright, 40 year old Adam Wainwright. Yeah. And I mean, Albert Pujols, it, it, it makes sense that he's going back and finishing with St. Louis, you know, cool that it makes sense. Fine. Good for baseball. I mean, the dude can barely walk to the plate anymore. I mean, it's, I was talking to somebody and he's like, I don't know why he just didn't retire. And I was like, look what he's getting. I mean, he's still getting paid money to play baseball. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's solid money, you know, for a year. And he's, I mean, I guess he got bought out of his last contract, right? I believe so. I think so. What if Christian Yelich remembers how to hit? That's not good for the Cubs or anyone else in that division. That's oh. uh, that's because if you get him hitting and your your team is doing the rest, you got your your well placed guys defensively that they always seem to have. And then you got your pitching dominating. Yeah. Christian Yelich went in 2019 was just a, a masher. And, and then he just, and I'm not going to use the word steroid, but it's hard to like, how did a guy go from batting like 329 to 205? I know he's had back issues. That's obviously part of it. Um, I don't want to accuse anything either. I don't think it's steroids or anything like biological, but there are always people commenting about blinky blinks in center field. I don't know if that's true or not, but there've been multiple people speculating something so you know i don't know but it was pretty amazing how how good he in 2018 2019 he was unreal he was absolutely unreal uh, i just like that milwaukee paid him <laughs> big contract yep and that is an albatross there for them because they're yep. they don't have i mean we think about the albatross contract that Jason Hayward is um, and the Cubs are a huge market team that they can, aff- I mean, in theory, they should be able to afford eating that contract and still having a winning team that they pay. The Brewers are not a big market team. Right. And those contracts really hurt. So, I mean, when the Brewers come back to reality, I- their team, they're going to come back hard because they're going to be stuck paying him and not be able to pay all these other players when they, their contracts are due. Yeah. That's why their windows a bit smaller. Yep. Stupid brewers. I just wish we, boy, if we had a pitching staff like the brewers, man, I mean, you know, I look at this off season and I say, you know, the moves they made for the most part, I like, but while I understand they were never going to be contenders this year, but at least make them as competitive as possible as you're raising the prospects in the system. If they could have just gotten one more quality starter and one more quality bat, a power run producing bat, if you could just have one more of each, I'd feel decently about them being a 500 team. But I don't think that's going to be the case. Nope. I agree. I don't think we're, we're seeing that. Um, uh, so who's going to be the opening day starter? I'm assuming Stroman Hendricks. It's been announced. Hendrick. Yep. Oof. Oof. I wish it was Stro, but let's just hope Kyle Hendricks finds the professor stuff. It'd yeah, be that's... hard with that wet, cold weather though. It's hard to grip the ball. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. It's going to suck having baseball again when I have to go back to the office. <laughs> yeah. I, I liked being able to just put it on in the background and while I worked, be able to just 
glance over and watch at bats and um you know see some plays but oh well you have to tune into the life. tune into the trusty old am radio and, and listen to the radio broadcast i picture you just taking out this small hand radio that is like ancient where like the antennas all bent and like <laughs> half the speaker is like pressed in and like the buttons are like stuck and you just take it out and you have those ancient ass like earphones, like from the eighties and you're just putting it on. And like everyone hears the loud, like click, click, click as you're trying to get it to work. And you're using like the little toggle thing, like trying to get a signal. I've got my, my Steve Bartman headphones. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I, yeah, that's exactly (laughs) what I was going for. Those type of headphones. Oh, you know, somewhere I've got a pair of those. Oh, we used to have a ton of those at home. I, I don't think we have any more, but uh, that yeah, was I my childhood. We, yeah, I think I purged most of those kind of headphones. Because earbuds kind of came a thing when I was like in middle school, high school. Yeah, and and then now I'm back to the over over the ear ones because uh, sound better, but still like not going to do those foam with the the cheap wire headphones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got for this show, I got my uh, wireless uh, noise canceling ones. So that's good to have for this. And then for like listening to music while exercising or away, I have the, uh, the cordless ones that's in the little pod, you open the pod and you put the, the things in your ears. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what I have either way. Now I'm all wireless now, which is nice because the way those wires got tangled, was really annoying. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I just remember like being in college and going to the gym when everything was wired and, you know, you're just like, oh, I can't, I can't listen to music. I can't do anything with these stupid wires getting tangled and everything. Do you remember when stores like record stores, music stores, bookstores that had like the, the music section you could listen to select songs. You'd put the the earphones in and you'd mm-hmm. listen to it. Yep. That was like my childhood. Um, I just saw this meme the other day. It was like <clears throat> going to Walmart in like 98 and it had like the, the TV with the, you could play the video games where it had the controller sticking out and the, the TV was up above the uh, rack and you would just like play the whatever video game that they had on the system there. Mm-hmm. I was like, ah, oh, that was fun. Being able to go there and play the games that you didn't have. Yeah. Yeah. I still look back at my childhood and uh, thinking of when we used to have TVs that were big boxes and glass screens. I mean, when we were growing up, we had one one TV in the house and it was a console TV. So it had like the the big like ornate wood thing around it that looked mm-hmm. like it was in a cabinet and it sat yep. on the floor. Um, and we had a VCR and it had a remote control, but the remote control was corded. It it was a cord that attached it to the the uh, the VCR but it was, it wasn't a very long cord. It was only like three feet. So, oh my God. So you had to get up and go over there, use the remote control to, to change things that you had to walk over there to use the remote control. Kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Uh, and yeah, I had an Atari 2600. So you had um, like, you had the, the, uh, the adapter that connected the Atari to your TV um, and it was just like old school adapter. And it's funny. I was like, I wonder if you can even like, if kids today would even know what the hell that was. Probably not. And, you know, I, I, we still had for a while, we still had to use that same adapter for the Nintendo because we had an old TV. And it wasn't until we got the newer TVs that we could plug the Nintendo in properly, right with the the stuff that came in the box for the Nintendo. It's so much different now than, uh, you know, you don't need an adapter. Everything, everything on your TV is, is already built there with like USB 
reports? Well, what's interesting is that last fall, it was either last fall or early winter, I bought for the basement for my parents, I bought them a new, uh, you know, HD plasma screen TV. So I bought that for them and they're like, oh, well, uh, did you make sure you got to the AVs and all that, you know, for the VCR? I'm like, they don't really make that anymore. Th- those AV ports, they don't make that stuff for big TVs like that anymore. No, so you're using that out. Right. So we, we found the adapter very easily online. You could go on Amazon and you can get, you could get those adapters, those AV adapters that you plug into the USBs or the HDMI ports and they work like a charm. They're just fine. But yeah, like, you know, I had to explain to them, like they, they don't, they don't make those anymore on TVs. Yeah. It's funny. We, uh, so we have like a VCR. It was my dad's, um, before he died. And, um, cause he still watched like VHS tapes. Mm-hmm. Um, but we just kept it because like, I don't know, every so often, like there'll be some like kind of educational thing that my daughter wants to watch and that we'll find on VHS and just be able to pop it in. So it just sits there. And it's also a DV it's a DVD player and a VHS player in one. So we we'll use that to like play like DVDs from the library or something. Yeah. But, we have one of those in the family basement, the, the yeah, combos, but it, you know, a newer T it's got the AV cable. So it's, it doesn't plug into newer TVs. Our TV is, that we have it plugged into is a, is a, it's not old. God, I mean, it's probably 15 years old now. Um, But like the new TVs, no, they just don't have that. No. And you know, it's nice that the cable adapters are so cheap, but you know, a lot of people still use AV for stuff though. I think in 10 years, nobody's going to really be using that anymore, but um, funny story. I, I hadn't used tapes in years, VHS tapes, but my basement, it, my, you know, my parents, what they have is they have, uh, you know, still have the VCR and I ordered something off Amazon. Cause it's a collector's item that I really wanted. It was, it's semi rare it, to have it, it. It's not rare, rare, but it's semi rare. Uh, this VHS, uh, you may remember this in like the 1980s, Ted Turner colorized a lot of the old black and white films to show on cable. Yeah. And one of the films, one of my favorite classic films was King Kong, the original King Kong. So they don't have this in DVD form or really anywhere else, but old VHS tapes is the colorized version of King Kong. So I found a tape and ordered it and I played it and it still worked in everything. It was in pretty good condition, but it was the first time I've watched a tape like in years. So a couple of years ago, I was at San Diego Comic-Con and there was a guy that was set up there and his thing is he, he basically has a giant warehouse that he um, preserves props from old movies Mm -hmm. um, that were otherwise just go in the trash. Mm -hmm. And I got to pose with the head of the original King Kong movie. Really? That's still around? Yes. The, the 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 giant head yes that's still around yes and i got to pose with it for five dollars in the really? five dollar donation to his to his funds from uh, 1933 yes because Cause i've only seen the pictures of the props like like the the stop motion puppet like the king kong stop motion puppet it doesn't have the fur like the muscle on it anymore it's just like the the skeleton. I've seen pictures of that. And then a few pictures of some like the other creatures, but I didn't know the head was still around. Yep. Do you have that picture? Uh, I'll have to dig it up. If you do, please send it to me. Cause I want to see what it looks like now. Yeah. So it was, uh, but he's got like all kinds of props and he's like, yeah, if you're you know, in California, you can go visit. We have this like giant warehouse with all kinds of stuff. Um, And, you know, our goal is to just preserve this so it doesn't get thrown away or, you know, a lot of stuff winds up in collector's hands, but just to make Mm -hmm. sure things don't, because there's so many iconic props, you know, like you don't want it to just kind of get destroyed. Um, Because there's a company that's also sets up a Comic-Con every year that it's an auction house and they auction these things off, but they put as a promotion, they always put like the, the marquee pieces on display for their next auction. 
and just some of the stuff like like this me and this thin panel of glass separating me from uh like a, a ghost trap from the Ghostbusters movie. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, that's cool. And actual armor from a stormtrooper from the 1977 Star Wars. And yeah, I've realize, seen that in a museum. Yeah. And like uh the the actual gizmo from Gremlins. Mm-hmm. And it's just all these like amazing props from like you know Indiana Jones whip. Uh you know, all these just amazing things. Um the the actual uh orb from phantasm um you know just so many cool things that are iconic and you're like um i'm standing next to it i'm there's me giving a thumbs up posing in a picture with with uh you know um like the the actual shoes Michael J. Fox wore in Back to the Future. Oh, the the automatic laces, the power yes. laces. And you're like, they're these are so cool. Like those type of things are just very iconic. It's sold. But like there's other stuff that just either was in less popular movies or wasn't as collectible back then, and just kind of, oh, this is trash, garbage. And and there you are getting meatball sauce all over it. <laughs> I geek out about like these movie props so bad. Um, Love it. It's, it's so good. A a friend of mine, he, he works on movie sets for a living and he's like, yeah, I always take some sort of prop home because he's a, you should, he's a set dresser. So he's got access to all that stuff. And he's like, yeah, I always take something home. And um, like, he's worked on like both, both the Ted movies with the uh, uh, Marky Mark and the bear. Mm -hmm. worked on like both of those he's worked on um most of ben affleck's movies that are the boston based ones um you know so he's just got props from all these movies that are just in his house and one day the puking stilts are going to be in a museum (laughs) you're like you're like what the hell is this uh um so I want to I want to move to the bears just a little bit, not a ton going on here, um, but uh, first is we have a, a new safety, Dane Crookshanks, and I really appreciated Twitter making all of the Harry Potter references. Yes, yes, I did too. <laughs> that was I knew Twitter wouldn't let me down on that one, um, and you know watching the film on him. <clears throat> Like, I don't think he's that bad. I, I have a feeling that he is there. They're slotting him in as the starter and they will probably, I'm sure they'll either draft somebody or bring in an undrafted rookie safety, um, you know, to compete, but probably be the backup. But I, I imagine that he, they're slotting him in to be the, the starting strong safety. And, uh, you know, watching him against tight ends, he did a really good job, uh, you know, limited play. So I don't know what he's going to look like over a full season, but for, for the contract they paid him, I think it's a steal. Yeah, no, it was a nice, nice deal. They got him on. And, you know, this is what you kind of hope to see in this bridge year coming up is guys that you might find in the bargain bin that end up being high value. You know, that he's one of those guys as a candidate to be one. Yeah. And it's another, another guy who's very young. He's in his mid twenties. So they, they look at him as ascending, an ascending player rather than a descending player. Um, You know, but still, I mean, you still have a, a roster that you need to um, turn over. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the potential of, of having Ryan Bates as as a uh, your guard and the uh the Buffalo Bills matched that contract offer and retained him and, and I see a lot of people just online super upset with Ryan Poles and the Bears for not being able to, to pull that deal off but honestly like the Bills they have the right of refusal so no matter what you do you they have the right to match it. And 
the only other, the only thing you can do is either just outbid them, just put in a massive offer. But is is he is he so good that you want to give him this giant offer? Right, ex- exactly. I mean, you would have been you would have been on borderline ludicrous if you're going to try to like outbid that. If you were going to really try to outbid that, that would have been a big financial commitment. And look, I was bummed they didn't get him, bummed big time, but. I'm not going to get mad at Ryan Poles for that one. No, he, Ryan Poles uh, offered him what he felt that he was willing to pay for Ryan Bates. And he front loaded it a little bit to, <clears throat> you know, and, and that's really what something you could do is, is you front load it because if the bills can't match that front loaded, then they, they can't sign him either. So he front loaded it somewhat and the bills found a way to match it. And so they'll, they'll keep him. And so it's kind of back to the, the drawing board for the bears, but you know what? I guarantee that they, they played it out a scenario where they didn't get him. It's not like they, um, you know, they were like, Oh, here's a, here's the guy we're getting. And, and that's it. The, you know, uh, they've, I'm sure they have plan B what they want to do. Um, right, right. They're still, and you know, you know, uh, the draft is less than a month away now. So will things start to shape up a little more before and after then? In terms of free um, agency? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much, how many more players the bears will sign before free agency. I would imagine one or two, but I think you'll see you'll see a, a lot of movement from them after the draft. Um, it would be nice if they could grab a veteran guard that's still on the market, like a Trey Turner or an yeah, Eric Flowers. I agree. Um, Cause that way, you know, it's always you scary. Add depth at that position. Yeah. I mean, you have, you're counting on youngsters on your tackle spots. You would probably like to have, uh, your guards be veterans if that's the case. So, uh, you know, an Eric Flowers or a Trey Turner, you can put in there, and suddenly, you know, is that a is a Tevin Jenkins, Larry Borum, Lucas Patrick, Cody Whitehair, and Trey Turner, Eric Flowers in a lead offensive line? No, but it's a serviceable offensive line. It's not going to get your quarterback killed. That's the big thing. And did you hear the whole thing about Justin Fields getting pissed off? He was pissed off about the game plan against the Browns last year. You know, I I, va- I I read a little bit of like headline about it, but I haven't had a chance to like read about it yet. So if you want to go into that one. Well, I mean, really all I have to say about that is like that right there, that game should have been a fireable offense. Absolutely. I mean, that was one of the most brutal games I've ever watched as a Bears fan. And I have watched so many terrible games. That was an all-timer. Was it the worst I've ever watched? No, but I'd say it was at least at least top five-ish. Had to be around top five. I mean, you know, they've got they've lost a lot of blowout games, but you know, am I, am I really going to remember and vomit over like the games a few years ago when Matt Barkley was playing quarterback? No, but you know, in terms of just having one of your young assets and one of the most talented players you've ever had at that position in your long history being put in that situation and making no real adjustments to try to protect him. It, it, it was just beyond baffling. That was one of those games where I had to listen to the post game and hear what every single analyst had to say, whether it was Dan Hampton, whether that was Ed Obradovich, whether that was uh, Jeff Joniak or Tom Thayer, any of those guys, Luke and Ellis, I had to hear what they all had to say because the fans clearly saw just how dog shit that was. Oh, it was so dog shit. And I, I, I just, 
I don't know how there was not somebody fired after that, it, or at least just like you know somebody laying into him because how do you, how do you if you're the coaching staff go through that game and look at yourself in the mirror without hating yourself like that was just bad I, it, it was almost like you were trying to prove a point right you almost got a kid killed but you know it's the bears they don't fire mid season nope the the purple crayon is put away for the season I put in my firing crayon i put it away in its holster he's got like a big fancy box for it that he keeps in his desk uh, when he puts on his like a six-year-old cowboy you know the cowboy costume that a six-year-old would wear it looks like it looks like woody from <laughs> from toy story <laughs> and, and he's got a crayon holster for his purple crayon <laughs> he's like don't make me break out this bad boy <laughs> it only comes out at the end of the season he, he's like he's like once this thing comes out it doesn't go back until it's drawn purple <laughs> <laughs> then it goes away for three four years Uh, ding dong George and the purple crayon. <laughs> uh. <laughs> One of the better things we've made up on this show. This bad boy has written many a bad contract. <laughs> 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 this, this, cra- this crayon has, uh, has dealt with many a bad GM that I've hired. <laughs> <laughs> this crayon has seen some things. Goes back to the 80s. This crayon is the same crayon that I had from the 85 Bears. <laughs> <laughs> I've never parted with it. Uh, that's my lucky purple crayon. <laughs> it hasn't brought in much luck over the past 20 years. Uh, so, I mean, I keep reiterating this is, you know, there are still players out there that are fit the mold of what the bears are trying to do of, you know, ascending players. Um, It just, I, I, I understand fans concerns that we're not pulling the trigger on them because these are guys that are probably willing to sign one year contracts at this point. So what is the harm of, of signing them now, because even if you draft somebody in that same position, uh, you know, you, none of those contracts are, are so high that you can't just cut them and, in part ways or, you know, move them down the depth chart. You don't have, they're not big enough contracts where you're sort of forced to start that player. Right. Um, you know, I, I just want to sort of fill out this roster because it is, I mean, I think, I think if you look at every contract we have, both the futures contract and actual deals, you need to bring like 90 people to camp and they, they need like 38 more players to, to fill out a roster to bring to camp. Yeah. There's a lot that needs to be done. I mean, on pretty much every side of the ball, both offense and defense, you got to bring guys in. And obviously the draft is going to be a big part of that. You know, you need a punter. You need people on the line. You need more receivers. You need more secondary help. I think you need more pass rush now that Mac is gone. I mean, you still have Quinn and you, you do have Roquan Smith, but you did, um, you know, as linebacker, but I did hear something about him possibly holding out until he gets an extension. I mean, they should, they've got, this is, this is actually a good time for an extension because you can then restructure the amount of money he's making and, and, you know, allow yourself even more room this off season. And that's uh, not a guy I want to trade. He's still in his prime and he's very, very good. Yeah. But I mean, you look and like, you don't have enough linebackers to fill out your roster. I think you have four linebackers under contract. You currently have three safeties. Um, you at least have enough pass rushers to fill out a roster would you like to upgrade some of them oh, yes absolutely absolutely like, i mean if you bring in somebody else uh 
you can part ways with with Jeremiah Tachu and and then save that for something million dollars off of your books. Um, but right now you sort of can't because you need you need the body. Um, you know, do they have enough receivers to physically field a full roster? Of, yes. But are you relying on Nisimba Webster, Daz Newsome, and Isaiah Coulter to mm-hmm. be half of those players? Mm-hmm. No. I mean, right now, Darnell Mooney and Byron Pringle are the only real wide receivers on this team. Equinemius I mean, maybe Saint- put St. Brown on that list too. He can prove himself to be one, but look at the contract he's he signed. They can part ways with that contract if he does not play well in uh, training camp and in the preseason. Sure. Yes. Um, or if they're able to trade for somebody or they draft some, like they could, they could easily squeeze him out. Um, you know, it's a, it's a one year deal under a million dollars. Uh, you need another tight end. You've got two. So whether you like those two or not, um, that's all you got. You know, you so they got Cole Komet and, uh, Jasper, uh, Jasper, Horstead. Jasper Horstead. Um, I, I wouldn't mind seeing them bring back Jesse James. I, I wouldn't either. Like I said, is, do I think Jesse James is elite? No, but he's got, he's got a decent amount of experience under him. He's still 27 and he built a decent rapport with, with Justin Fields. So I, I'm, I wouldn't mind that. I wonder what's going to happen to Jimmy Graham. He's rich. He's going to retire. Nope. Think he's I going mean, to retire. Who's going to pay? Who's going to sign him? I don't know. Maybe some low team gets desperate for a veteran. I don't know. And pay him. I can't believe that Ryan Pace paid that man $16 million. Oh, so much money. Like I liked Jimmy Graham as a player, even past his prime, but that was so much money. Like, what in the world was he thinking? I need to pounce on this now because I need to get all my former Saints guys. So I'm scared that there's going to be a big market for washed up Jimmy Graham. So I'm going to overpay him. Speaking of overpay, former Bear, uh, our our friend Andy's uh, got a new got a new home. Yes, he does. Um, I'm I'm rooting for him. Me too. Uh, but you know, he, he still got a payday from the Bears. Because one year deal, obviously with the Saints, it was nowhere near what he was making with the Bears last year. Because I think he made what five million with the Cowboys and the Saints. It's worth up to six million, including three million guaranteed. So the Bears paid him ten million. And 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 what happened is here. Here's exactly what happened: is when he was parted ways with the Bengals, the Cowboys basically told him, you know, after he exhausted any option of being a starter, they were like, "All right." Your, here's backup money, a good backup money, but here's backup money. And then when uh, he played meh for the Cowboys, the Bears were like, okay, well, we need a starter. Andy Dalton has been a high-level starter in this league. And they told him he's QB1 to get him there. Because if you're a quarterback, you know, and you're getting offered backup money everywhere, then of course you're going to sign with the best team or the best spot for you to start. And, you know, the bears were desperate to, to bring in somebody with a veteran experience. And so they were like, okay, Andy Dalton is our guy. And that to, in order to guarantee they get him, they had to tell him he was QB one. And so between him and his agent, they're like, oh, well, we're QB one. And then they're like, okay, that that means that we're going to lean that way to go there. And his agent then, I'm sure, said, well, if he's QB1, you've got to give him QB1 money. Low-end QB1 money, but you have to pay him like a starter. That's at least $10 million in a season. And so 
the Bears by promising him QB1 had to overpay to get him because otherwise, you know, they could have lost him. And and going into the draft with Nick Foles as your only QB, you really are painting yourself in a corner. So we got to get the ginger beard. I mean, the Brian Pace... And, and when I s- explain what happened, I'm not justifying it. It was terrible management. I'm just telling you those are the facts. That's what happened. No, I know. Yeah, and, I get it. I get it. Ryan Pace, just that, that should have been a fireable offense right there. Um, but the one thing I am glad is, as much as I would like the Bears to have the seventh overall pick this year, can you imagine the bears having the super high pick in a year where there's no quarterbacks worthy of that pick? Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. Having a high pick this year wouldn't do you as much good if you didn't have a quarterback. I mean, imagine if we had to watch last year with no future quarterback and then come into this year with a new regime with no future quarterback. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how things would have gotten rebuilt differently if the bears had no Justin Fields and the seventh overall pick. I I would have to imagine the game plan would be a lot different right now. Yeah. Could very well be. I mean, you know, good possibility that Trubisky could be the quarterback for the bears this coming season. If we didn't have Justin Fields. Sure. Sure. Um, or, you know, uh, who else would have been available? Because I don't think they would have brought Andy Dalton back. They wouldn't have brought Andy Dalton back. They This regime would not have traded for uh, Russell Wilson. No. Um, Ride with Nick Foles? No. Uh, I'm guessing Mariota, maybe. Trubisky, maybe. Um try to overpay Jameis Winston possibly, but he didn't even get Cam overpaid. Newton. <laughs> no, no, no Cam. Newton. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but did you see that Taysom Hill is essentially the, will no longer be played at quarterback. <laughs> Should have been done a while ago. Frankly, honestly. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they paid him, like, I can't believe that, that they paid that guy the kind of contract they paid him. Yeah, it was crazy. And how many quarterbacks have we seen play for the Saints since Drew Brees left, even just this past year or so? Because didn't they have that one guy from Notre Dame make a start, Ian Book? I believe they did, yeah. And think- it's just awful. Yeah. Um, you know, but now they – uh. Now they've got options down there. And Andy Dalton going to go crazy in the dome. And none of them, none of those options are named Taysom Hill. No. <laughs> Unless it's an absolute emergency. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a nice thing to have, you know, if you're playing him as a position player is you don't have to worry about having a third quarterback on the roster because you're like, well, he could play quarterback in a, in a absolute pinch. Right. Um, like that's, that's nice, but man, you, you're overpaying him for that. Yeah. They, they gave him a ton of money and look at all the cap issues. The saints have had. And still currently have. And still currently have. Yes. Even though Drew Brees is gone. Yes. Well, I mean, that was part of it. Um, but it, it's funny. If you look at the NFL this year, casual football fans that are like they'll watch games and they know who the big players are when they go to watch this new season they're going to be so confused because so many big name players have just changed teams Mm -hmm. you know and and tom brady went from retiring to unretiring and bruce arians retired because tom brady came back hates his guts and just so wild 40 day retirement tour 
eh, I went to one recital. I'm done. <laughs> I went to one goddamn dance class and I can't take it. I can't take it. Put me back on the football field. <laughs> uh, but man, I, I'm so excited for the NFL draft. I really am. I love the NFL draft. It's like my Christmas. I mean, it is my favorite of all the drafts. Far and away, my favorite draft is the NFL. Draft. Yeah, I mean, it's the it's the best. But I just I just love it because you know I, I watch college football and seeing these guys transition and um, you know really trying to scout them and you know it's it's not like baseball or hockey where all right the guy you draft you may not see him for four or five years you may never see him Mm -hmm. like they may never make this team with football you're going to see them in a few weeks yeah exactly they're going to be at those rookie mini camps they'll be in training camp they will be in the preseason games you will see them play and um they make immediate impacts and uh you know in in the NBA, you know, it's, it's not too far behind, but it's really after the first round, the vast majority of second rounders are just non-factors. And, but in the NFL, you got guys in the seventh round that are still, uh, you know, you know, valuable, valuable players that are contributors to your team. And look at uh, look at Tom Brady. Yeah, Tom Brady. He did him all right for himself as a sixth round draft pick. Did you know he was taken in the sixth round? Has anyone ever told you that? <laughs> I bet they f- till the end of time they will never not mention that during the NFL draft. It'll be hundreds of years. He'll be long gone, and they will still be talking about it. Yes, they'll be running old black and white footage of him, and they'll be like. Tom Brady, the greatest quarterback that ever played, was a six-round pick. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. I remember when I took him back in the sixth round. He was a stick, <laughs> and he didn't have any mass to him. Yeah. I want, I want to take the, you know, the meme of, uh, of uh, Spice Adams, where he's in the yellow suit rubbing his hands together yes. behind the tree. I want to put that and be like a Mel Kuyper getting ready to tell you that Tom Brady was a six round pick. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Spice um, Adams is one of the best memeable guys ever. Like he's got, he's got a number of memes. He's got that meme. He's got the aha ha, and then he just looks down like he hates his life. <laughs> That's a great meme too. Well, Spice Adams is hilarious. He's a great. He's a great personality. Um. Uh, he he's so funny. Like when when he initially got released by the Bears, um, I don't know if you ever saw the videos he was making where he's like uh, trying to trying to keep uh working out, so I'm ready to go. And you know he shows him doing like a week workout, and then gets on the phone with with to his agent. He's like, "How's it going? Anything good? What you got for me?" <laughs> <laughs> He's he's just hilarious. Uh, I love Spice Adams. Who doesn't, man? He's a legend. Uh, you want to talk about these bulls? Yeah, you know it's it's weird. We had that amazing comeback win against the Clippers the other night. I mean, incredible. Demar Derozan scores fifty, and the place is going nuts. It feels like a playoff game. Patrick Williams has a game on uh, on him. Yes, yes, he does. Patrick Williams was showing off his potential that night. And you're thinking, you know, is this the game, the game, where they kind of turn things around? And then the game against the Heat, which I didn't see, but oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, and I, I think there's there's one topic that I think we have to bring up in all this. What the hell happened to Kobe White? I just, you know, this team, I, we keep saying it, that they only function as a well-oiled machine and not 
and not a series of superstars that can take over. And, you know, you had the injuries that caused the guys that were there to play a lot of minutes. Now everybody's got some nagging injuries and wear and tear and they're tired and they still don't have everybody back. And sounds like Lonzo ball will not be back. Uh, and, and they, all of the other issues that they have suddenly come to light because people recognize what the bulls Achilles heel is, and there's nothing they can do about it. The team can't rebound. Um, defensively without they they don't have any defensive stoppers in the middle of the lane so without alex caruso being fully healthy and lonzo ball being there to clog up the passing lanes you get the ball down low and it's easy points the the paint the paint defense of the bull i mean opponents just eat them for breakfast in the paint yep and just look at the guys that you're going to be facing in, in the, the postseason. Yep. You know, it's funny. I was talking with my buddy the other day about matchups. They're like, that's not a good matchup. That's not a good matchup either. That's not a good matchup either. And we're talking Milwaukee, the heat, the 76ers, the Celtics. It's like, none of these guys are good matchups, but you're going to have to play one of these teams in the playoffs but right now, you don't feel good about the matchup with any of those teams. It's going to be one of those teams. Unless you have to go to the play-in tournament, it's going to be one of those teams. Yeah, if if they don't drop, I, I'm really hoping they don't drop into that play-in. But they're up by two games over Cleveland, and the Bulls have four games left. So it's going to be, I'm hoping that they, they stay where they are. Hope. Um, but it's looking like it's going to flip flock back and forth between either playing Boston in the first round or Milwaukee in the first round. Yeah, that's, that's not good. That's not good. I, I, I still not a big believer in Boston. Um, so if I had to pick other two, I'd rather play Boston in the first round. Yeah. Because I don't think you have a prayer against the 76ers or Milwaukee. No, no, you don't. I mean, especially, yeah, I mean, those two teams are just, I think you got a puncher's chance against the Heat, even though they're a better team than you. You got a puncher's chance. I don't think you have, a, uh, you know, any sort of hope against the 76ers or the Bucks. Right. You got a farts chance in a windstorm. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> I usually t- say uh, snowball's chance in hell, but sure. Uh, so uh, I don't know. It's I don't want any p- part of that play-in game, and um, I it, things are just looking rough. And the last four games here, the Bucks, the Celtics, which are your two likely first round matchups, uh, the Hornets and the Timberwolves. So if you can win those last two, I think you sort of guarantee not playing in the uh, the playing game. Yeah, I just, I just please, for the love of God, avoid that playing game. Because I think you have the season's the the head to head record against the uh, the Cavs, so and you are two games ahead of them. So I think you just need to win two of those four, right? You're not, and you are not winning the first two, so you really got to win those the Hornet and the T Wolves game. Yep, yep. But those two teams are going to play hard. But you you better be prepared to play harder. Yeah, I mean the the Bucks and the Celtics are going to still be playing because. They're they're playing for seeding, right? Right. Um, though that it's tight. Like the East is is tight. Um, so those teams are still fighting for a home court advantage, and so they're not going to take it easy on the Bulls. They're not going to they're not going to give them anything. No, no, they're not. Um, I'm just looking at the the updated standings here. 
Mountain. NBA standings. Um, the Heat are up by a game and a half over the Celtics. Celtics are a half game over the Bucks. And the Bucks are tied with the 76ers. It's tight. And then Toronto is two and a half behind the 76ers and the Bucks. And the Bulls are a half game behind Toronto. And oh, it looks now they're now two and a half up on the Cavs. So that's good. Um I believe if they win one more game, they avoid that play in tournament. Let's see. They need to win at least one. At the very least, they need to win one. Yeah. Um, da, 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 I'm just looking at the Cavs. Rest of their skit. So it looks like the Cavs have three games left. Yeah. So I think the Bulls, you're right, just need to win one. And the Cavs have to play the Nets the Bucks and the magic. So they're probably got, they're probably going one and two in those three games. Yeah. We'll see how it all unfolds. Um, sure. It would be nice if, well, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, um, looking at the bracket on nba.com oh so things got updated since uh i started prepping so right now it would be the bulls versus the 76ers oh wait no this can't be right Um, oh yeah no because this has it would be the bulls versus uh, Milwaukee and Toronto versus the 76ers. So I, I don't know which one is a worse position to be in. Yeah, well. I think their best chance is is I mean, listen. Uh, Miami Miami, uh, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, and Boston. Pick your poison. I mean, it'd probably be Boston first, and then following with Miami. I don't want really to play Miami, but like you said earlier, and I said this to my friend the other day too, I, if I had to choose between three teams, if I had to choose Miami, Milwaukee, or Philadelphia, I'd choose Miami over either Milwaukee or Philadelphia. Yeah, I would too. They're just a terrible matchup with the 76ers. So if I'm picking my my order, it is Boston, then Miami. Even I'm gonna say Milwaukee or sorry, Philadelphia, then Milwaukee, just because you can pray that Joel Embiid sprains his ankle and can't play. And then you got a, got a chance, but if Joel Embiid stays healthy, he's just going to destroy you. Um, And you've never beaten him. No. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Don't like any of this. Yeah, no. no. Re- remember when we were so high on the Bulls and things just really changed drastically between injuries and the league figuring out that they can't rebound. Oh, the rebounding is one of the most frustrating things. We, you know, the, the defense is obviously an issue, but the lack of rebounding, the lack of rebounding has directly resulted in the several losses. You can you can look at several losses over the stretch, and you can attribute that to lack of rebounding. You know what the good news is about all this is, though, right? Is the Los Angeles Lakers are not going to make the playoffs. Yeah, you want to talk about garbage? 
That is a garbage team there. Yeah, the yeah, it's a it's a retirement home. It's injury prone. It's it's guys like that don't fit. Like Russell Westbrook, now that he's older, he can't use his athleticism, and when he's not using his athleticism, you know, he's not Steph Curry when it comes to shooting. That's for sure. Um. Yeah, it's don't let LeBron be your your GM. <laughs> no. no, and I'm going to throw this out there. I think the team that will represent the Western Conference in the NBA Finals is going to be the Memphis Grizzlies. I could see it. They're they're a hell of a team. I I could see them. I could see the Suns. You know, either of those teams, I could see them doing it. Uh, is uh, my dude Ja Morant? I think is going to do it. I think he's going to take them, take them to the promised land. Um, hey, I, I could get behind that team. It's a good team. It's fun to watch. <sighs> John Morant is an animal. I mean, that guy is so good. You know, what's funny is, is everybody was like, what kind of idiot wouldn't to, uh, you know, you, you take Zion Williamson and John Morant was the guy the whole time. I think if uh, you redid that draft today, he would be the obvious number one pick. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't even know who I go out on a limb with the Eastern Conference and say. I think it's going to be Milwaukee again. Yeah, Milwaukee versus Memphis. It's it's going to be a, man, it's going to be a, a series that nobody outside of the Midwest cares about. <laughs> right. Um, the, uh, the league is probably rooting for golden state versus Philadelphia or something. Got to have an East coast team. Got to have, got to have the big name teams. The national media is just mad that their precious Knicks and Lakers won't be in it. Yeah. Both of the, uh, they're both the 11 seeds. Wonk wonk. Do you think that the Nets have a chance? Maybe I just KD is obviously really, really good. I I just I just don't know. I they're, they've been so inconsistent this year. Do I think they technically have a chance? Yes. Am I going to put money on them? No. Did you see the video of uh? Uh, there's a video of somebody yells to Kevin Durant from the, the stands. They're like, take this game over KD. And he turns and looks at the guy and he goes, shut the fuck up and sit down. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, uh, that's too good. Super good. Uh, but I, I don't know the the bulls, the bulls are not going to win any series in this in this uh this year i don't see it i mean this is still a big step forward from last year of course oh absolutely of course like we kind of kind of got to remember that i think we got uh this was the step forward year i just think the hot start got maybe pushed our expectations a tad that's exactly what i was going to say is our expectations got really pushed based on the beginning of the season this is still i mean you know, health is going to be big, but I honestly think there's, you can work on this team and, and find a way to make them a competitive team in the postseason. Um, you know, we've already, we've seen with one year, one off season, uh, AK just absolutely turned this team around and, you know, we're going to, we're going to see, we're going to see more improvement. We're going to see, you know, they'll bring in defenders into the, uh, the paint rebounders. There's, there's room to, to, to do things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I guess we can wrap this up that the Blackhawks exist. And they lost to the coyotes in overtime. A terrible coyotes team. 
Yeah, yeah. They've lost to them twice now this year. Uh, Kevin Lankinen did everything he could. He stood on his head, but then, um, yeah, then a bad bounce after a penalty. And, yeah, just um, just some ugly stuff. But it's official who the next play-by-play man for the Hawks is going to be. Oh, they announced it? Yes, they announced it during the first intermission. It was Chris Vosters was named. Um, you know, the same night that Jonathan Tays was honored after his 1,000th game, Marion Hosa, Brett Seabrook, uh, Burrish, Sharp, they were all in it. Crawford, they were all in attendance. So that was a nice little thing that they did there. But yeah, you know, big news was Chris Foster's is going to replace Pat Foley next year. And as much as I want this Blackhawks season to end as just absolute garbage as this all is, that last game with Pat Foley is going to be an emotional one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it still sucks that Pat Foley's getting pushed out. I mean, I know. Sh- sure, he's always going to throw something out of left field that's going to get him in trouble. But uh, uh, it's, it's really hard to replace a beloved guy. It is. It's someone who's been doing it for so long. Um, I don't know. What What are yeah. your thoughts on on Vosters? I mean, he's young. Is he's even thirty? I I don't know how old he is, but I think he's going to do a good job. I think he's going to do a very good job. But it's just not going to be the same. It's going to take some time to adjust. I think he's going to be very solid at what he does. He's very well spoken. I'm happy for him i congratulate him i'm ready to listen to him it's no fault of his own it's just going to be a difficult transition i feel all right question is chris voster still going to be the play-by-play announcer the next time the blackhawks make the playoffs i would hope (laughs) Uh, i mean i would hope like i I just, I don't see what the path is for this team to be good anytime soon. I mean, you know, if you, if you, uh, even if you draft and you draft, well, you got, you, you do, you got to develop those guys, you know, you got to take the time to develop those guys. Now you hope that once some salary clears the books that you're able to make some moves, but to build a full frontage team it's going to take some time yeah oh i mean it's going to take serious time um i I just uh you know you look you look at what they got on the roster and what they have under contract you know is kane a building block absolutely not because he's he's about to turn 34 years old that's not a building block. Jonathan Taves is a shell of his former self. Um, I mean, Alex DeBrinket is hitting his prime right now. So do you build around him? Probably not because he's, by the time that you're ready to be good, he's going to be, you know, close to 30. Unfortunately. Seth Jones, that's that's just an albatross contract. Um, you know, Calvin DeHaan, Tyler Johnson are in the 30s. Um, Dominique Kubalik, not one of your building blocks. Uh, you know, I'm hearing people trying to even say that Dylan Strom is going to be a building block, and I don't know what planet they live on. Um, I mean, honestly, part of, uh, part of, part of the reason why your, your rebuild is going to take a long time is because guys that you're really counting on just haven't been good enough. Kirby doc, not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was high on Kirby doc coming out, but it's been pretty disappointing so far. Um, you know, so 
I just, I don't know what the path is to this team being good because they are so devoid of talent. Long way off, long, long way off. I mean, I, I honestly think four to six years is probably realistic before they're even, they're even can sniff the playoffs. Could be. I mean, it feels that way. It feels like it's going to be at least three. And it's more than just to make the playoffs. You want to make the playoffs and be legitimate contenders, not just squeak in and get eliminated right off the bat. Uh, and, you know, next year is just going to really suck because um, you're going to have the first year of that Seth Jones contract kick in, and you're still paying Taves and Kane a poop ton of money. Um, so you're not going to have ever, you're not going to have, you know, a, uh, a big chunk of money to, to pay players. And some next year is just going to be a shit show. I mean, the first year you're probably going to be able to do any sort of building is the 23, 24 season. Because at that point, then you don't have a ton of money tied up. You just got really, I mean, you'll probably move on from Jake McCabe and Tyler Johnson by then. Mm -hmm. So it's really just the Seth Jones contract. And then that's about it. Uh, So you've got at least your whole, your whole uh, salary cap almost to, to play with, to do something. But you know you've got to you've got to get some building blocks there. Yeah, it, it's going to be a long process, and hopefully this off season will at least give somewhat of a snippet of what could be next. At least maybe either establish some building blocks, establish a plan, and just kind of see where we're at with some of this. Um, yeah. So this is just a shit show. Um. There's one more thing I totally forgot to talk about when we were talking about the bears that I wanted to touch on Hmm. is, did you happen to see the barstool guy have a, yeah. And I feel that I appreciate the fact that bears Twitter, who was at each other's throats for the better part of the, you know, the last three weeks about free agency and, and their feelings about Ryan poles and the bears uh, front office staff all join forces to just berate this stupid guy. If it, if all it took to create peace and harmony among bears, Twitter was some Jamoke, then thanks, Mr. Jamoke. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jamoke. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bears fans should be ashamed to go to your QB one. Because you didn't want to take a picture and autograph me. Really? Oh, I don't even know who that loser is. I never heard of him. I had never heard of him, and he's got a blue check mark. I don't get it. I don't know who he is or why, but um, you, pretty much what a loser. I, I can't believe like that grown ass man cried about about somebody not wanting to take a picture with him and the yeah, person that was took it. the picture with him yeah exactly he got his picture I so dumb uh, I mean you know like listen I a couple years when the NFL draft was in Chicago I had a, a work meeting at one of the hotels down there and at the hotel, like I saw um, Larry Fitzgerald walking into the hall in the lobby. I saw uh, um, Urban Meyer walking in the hallway. I saw like a bunch of people just walking around because th- the draft was going on there. And I was in one of the fancy hotels and I saw uh, the bus and I was like, can I take a picture with you? And he just goes, if you make it fast and in the picture, I am smiling with an 
ear to ear grin and he looks like he wants to bite my face off. Yeah. And you know what? He clearly didn't want to take a picture with me, but he did. And I was appreciative and I don't care that he's not smiling. You know why? Because I'm I'm an adult that has other things to worry about in my life. If if the bus would have told me, no, I don't want to take a picture with you. Guess what? I'd be fine. I wouldn't have sat in my car in my poopy pants and made a big deal of it. And I don't, I'm not even a, a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. I don't care anything about Pittsburgh Steelers or Notre Dame. I just, you know, he was a really good football player and he was there right in front of me. And I was like, let me take a picture with him. You know, just like people find so many stupid things to worry about that, the, that don't matter. And and then to go public on the internet with these stupid things, you know, you're going to like, how did he not know he was going to get dragged for this? He thinks it's a victory somehow. Cause he went and ranted like a child. He thought it was a victory. Yeah, this was not a victory. That guy is just getting dragged. So, yeah. <sighs> People are weird. I don't get them. Weirdos. Let me, you know, it's, it's always a loss when you go in your car to make a video. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. The only thing that could have been worse if he put his sunglasses on when he made the video. Yeah. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I've said my piece. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, et cetera. Uh, share this podcast with your friends. It's how we grow the show. Follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com. Uh, follow Alex at ShyFanPat2 or AlexanderJPatCreative.com for all the cool stuff that Alex does. And again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Uh, 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 Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.